Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Special welcome to uh, the leadership of the firms. I see we've got quite a number. Our colleagues, I see there's also um, our colleagues that registered for the webinar from the EFR. See there's lots of academics on the call. We've got CFOs, we've got financial managers, accountants, internal auditors. There's also other representatives of other regulators. We've got the colleagues from the AGSA. We've got SICA on the call, SIPA. Our directors from the IRPA, special welcome to them. We've got boards and committee members on the call. Our IRBA staff. And good morning, good afternoon, everyone on this call. Uh, the time now is two minutes past two. I think we can start. I see some are still joining. But I'm sure you'll agree with me that we cannot wait. We only have two hours to go through the whole program. It's a big report. So if we want to cover everything, including the question and answer session, we need to start. Thank you all for joining. By way of introduction, I am um, Tlambika Zukulwa. I'm currently acting as a director inspections at the IRBA. I will be facilitating this first part of uh, of this webinar. A well, welcome to a warm welcome to you all um, on this 2021 public inspections report launch. We're very excited uh, by the huge response from this diverse audience. We hope that you'll find this webinar very informative. It is a feedback session and therefore would like to see that it would be helpful in understanding the inspections results as well as audit quality in general. We are now sitting at 263 participants. In total, we've got about almost 600 participants for this webinar. And few things to note, kindly note that um, we have disabled our chat box. You can please forward all of your questions, comments to the, there's an email address that is on the screen. Please make use of that. We'd love to hear from you. We will try and make sure that we answer all and attend to all of your questions during the Q&A session later on. But if it, but it, if it happens, because we, we end the session at four o'clock, if it happens that we don't get to your specific question, we will make sure that we respond to you directly on your email. I think we can start. You can go to the next slide. Thank you. I see on this slide we've also included the the, res the response to the survey that we included during your registration and thank you very much for participating in this survey. Uh, it is encouraging to see that we're sitting at about 70, almost 75 percent of the attendees on this call that make use of our inspection report. It does show that there's more people that are interested and that um, more people are interested in making sure that they improve the audit quality at the firms and at their institution. It is very important that there is improved audit quality. Just briefly about our webinar, it is divided into two sessions. The first part is a presentation part of session where we will have our speakers. We have a very good lineup. And the last session is a question and answer session where we will we would have collated all of your questions and they will be attended to. The purpose of this webinar 
it's it's a feedback session. It's to take you through uh, the 2021 inspections report to facilitate your understanding of the report and the understanding to a greater audience. It is also to create awareness on the inspections outcomes or results. We hope this session will also encourage the 25% that does not yet make use of our reports to find it easy to navigate through it and that it will encourage them to read it, download it, read it, and make use in future. At this point, I would like to take this opportunity to um, thank the whole of the inspections department for the efforts uh, they put in performing these inspections. Their commitment in um, serving our public and to protect public interests. Doing, I always say doing inspections is not an easy job. You have to report negatively. You have to discuss those difficult areas and you have to face um, those discussions on those negative um, findings. So it's a calling itself. Your commitment is commendable. I also want to um, send a special thanks to our inspection committee members. They work very hard on our reports. They review our reports, they um, conclude, and they make decisions on the reports that we send to them, the reports that are included in this inspections report. Their work is not very easy. It's not the only thing they do. They have their normal jobs, but over and above that, they are committed to serve the public of South Africa. We really thank them for that. They do it for no commercial gain. It is just to contribute to the auditing profession. Few things to note before we get to um, the business of the day. The webinar does not really replace the public inspections report. I know most of you understand that. We do therefore encourage all of you to read and understand the detailed report. The report contains a lot of information. There's a lot of effort that has been put um, in this report to collate the information that is included. Um, it also works as an educational tool um, for everyone to understand these findings. We therefore encourage you to download it and read it. In reading this report, it is also in, important to read with that understanding that it is an inspections process and our inspections process is, um, is risk-based. So we don't necessarily select a random selection. In that the selection is, is really not representative of the whole population that we review. So because it is risk-based, we will um, address or, or we will put more effort on areas that are risky. And therefore, you cannot take our results and extrapolate over the whole population. It's also important that the findings that you see that we have raised, in that we always raise, do not necessarily um, imply that the audit opinion that has been issued by the registered auditor is incorrect. So the findings that we raise do not necessarily indicate an audit failure. By highlighting these findings um, in the reports, we encourage the firms or auditors to deal with these areas proactively to avoid um, future problems or to improve their quality at the firms. The last thing that we I want to highlight to you um, is that uh, the IRBA um, inspection comes later in the process. 
and therefore the role of uh, the IRBA inspections team is not necessarily to uh, manage audit quality at our firms. It remains the responsibility of the leadership of those firms to take that oversight role, that oversight responsibility on the system of quality of quality controls at the firms. So in this report, I had already said that we've included a lot of information. Over and above that, you see that we've highlighted some important documents and we will post these at the end of this um, session. The links where you'll be able to get this PIR, we call it a PIR, it's a public inspections report, and other relevant information that you will find useful for you to understand the process, for you to navigate through the results. Next, I will be taking you through the program of the day. I said before that we've got a very good lineup. Our first presentation um, on the IR is on the IRBA uh, five-year strategy by Imbre Negi. Imbre has been with the IRBA for over nine years as a director of inspections. I'm currently acting in his position. He is currently acting as a CEO of the IRBA. Imbre also sits at um, as a board member at EFR, the International Forum of Independent Regulators, Audit Regulators, sorry, where he also sits as a chairman of the Audit Committee. I'll hand over to you, Imbre. Thank you, Nklambi, for the kind introduction, and thank you to all the delegates for taking the time this afternoon to attend uh, the webinar. Today's feedback on inspections, and I think Nklambi has already uh, introduced you to, to, the, to the purpose of today's webinar. Uh, it's a feedback session, but it is mainly developmental and remedial in nature with the key objectives of promoting audit quality as well as promoting a better understanding among broader stakeholders of what our inspections process seek to achieve. We thank the practitioners and the firm leadership for cooperating with our inspections process, especially during the last two years with, with uh, COVID-19. Um, but I think what's more important is that we've been forming an effective partnership with a common goal of enhancing audit quality that will ultimately rebuild confidence in the audit product. The past two years have seen us change the way we perform inspections. Um, COVID-19 has prompted us to implement remote inspections um, enabled by technology and through the assistance of the firms. Uh, and it's, it, it was to protect both the auditors and our staff. Surprisingly, these remote inspections resulted in uninterrupted inspections, continuing with the cooperation of the firms again, even resulting in more efficient and effective inspections at the cost of physical interaction, of course, which brings another set of challenges. But I can safely say that the inspections department has operated since uh, the since COVID-19 in 2020 uninterrupted to date. We will continue with this practice of remote inspections until it is safe to implement on-site inspections again at the firms, but probably uh, on a hybrid basis where we won't be there every day and some of the, some members of the team might be able to work remotely. We trust that you will find this webinar of value and the information informative uh, in your respective disciplines.
I would like to start or continue by explaining the role of the audit regulator. Our enabling legislation and mandate comes from the Auditing Profession Act of 2005 as amended. And most recently, the Auditing Profession Amendment Act was signed into law by President Ramaphosa in April last year, strengthening the independence and the enforcement powers of the RBA. In essence, the RBA aims to create an ethical, value-driven financial sector that encourages investment, confidence, and protects the financial interests of the public. This is achieved through the regulation and licensing of registered auditors and audit firms to provide statutory and voluntary assurance services. In terms of our enhanced comprehensive stakeholder strategy, it is important to note that we are a hybrid audit regulator in that we, on the one hand, set entry requirements and standards for registered auditors, and on the other hand, we inspect and enforce the standards, taking action where necessary. It is important when, you know, to, when we engage with our stakeholders, um, we, we think it's important to understand our dual role as a standard setter and a re regulator, especially setting the context in which we engage with our stakeholders. Next slide, please. Um, so from a strategic perspective, um, we have experienced several high profile corporate failures, which created a global crisis of confidence in financial reporting and auditing. And South Africa is by no means an exception. These failures attracted sensational coverage in the mainstream media, implicating auditors in the failures and criticizing the auditing profession in general for failing to protect the public interest. These events increased investors' expectations for international standard setters, regulators and auditors to do more in relation to preventing corporate failures that were caused by undetected fraud and misrepresentation. As the RBA, we have therefore updated our five-year strategy. Um, our strategy was tabled last year in Parliament. We call it our refocused five-year strategy, stretching uh, from last year, 2001 to 2005. And it focuses on three key areas. First and foremost, on audit quality. Audit quality forms the backbone of the profession. Uh, and without audit quality, they cannot be trust in the audit product by investors. Secondly, our focus is on sustainability and relevance of the regulator and the profession. Maintaining the relevance of an audit, maintaining the relevance of an audit opinion to provide trust over financial information and financial reporting. And lastly, we also focus comprehensively on our stakeholders through engagement such as this for today, with a view to promote broader reforms and enhancements in the auditing profession and even broader. I believe we can all agree that until we have improved audit quality and have collectively taken significant steps to transform and innovate the entire financial reporting and governance environment, the audit profession in particular will find it difficult to rebuild trust. You might ask now, how are we going to restore trust in the auditing profession with all the things that we've seen over the past number of years, not just here, but also globally? Well, in answer to that question, the RBA, last year established th three strategic work streams led by our executive management, which focuses on three areas. Firstly, there's a focus on the financial reporting and governance ecosystem. This falls mostly outside of the RBA's mandate because our we are only mandated to regulate auditors, external auditors. We are not mandated to regulate accountants and other accounting bodies uh, besides uh, SICA. 
And we re we've recognized that this approach requires broad stakeholder outreach, buy-in and support to call for broader reforms. For example, strengthening of our governance practices in the country, strengthening of our lines of defense in companies. You have the preparers of financial information, you have the internal auditors, you have the audit committees and the board committees, um, you have reg other regulators, you have the auditors then coming in towards the end of the process to issue an opinion over the financial statements prepared by management. And after that, the regulator has a responsibility to, to also look after the auditors. So that those lines of defense uh, needs to be strengthened. And um, enhancing and accountability and prosecution of those decision makers who committed the fraud in the first place is something that we can see is happening currently. And uh, it's a good thing that accountability in, in the whole in, entire ecosystem is starting to happen. Auditors still have an important responsibility to issue an opinion and in terms of the standards and the ethical requirements that they have to follow. So yes, auditors definitely has also play a very important role in this uh, in the lines of defense and in this ecosystem. Secondly, our second work stream focused specifically on the auditing profession in the country. This falls squarely within our mandate and it um, it talks to where there are gaps in the standards or in the regulatory framework of the regulator. We have a mandate to, to identify those and to identify enhancements. And lastly, we also have a work stream that look at our own internal processes, our capacity and our expertise to um, effectively function as a regulator and be future fit. We are seeking some quick wins together with stakeholders uh, while implementing a process of analyzing the broader ecosystem and the auditing profession, as well as our own processes for gaps, uh, with the ultimate goal of identifying measures that will help plug these gaps and ultimately help restore confidence. These projects are underpinned by our comprehensive stakeholder strategy because we know, we recognize that the success of these reforms can only be achieved if all the role players in the ecosystem come to the party. Before I hand over to Ntlambi, our Acting Director Inspections, I think it's important to note our affiliation with the International Forum of Independent Audit Regulators, IFIA. It's an international member organization comprising independent audit regulators such as the RBA from 54 countries that regularly share information and collaborate to enhance audit quality at a global level. The EFR, for example, engages annually on multiple occasions with the leadership of the big, big six net, network firms globally on matters of audit quality, technology and enhancements in the auditing profession to meet investor needs. Currently, uh, the RBA is a member of the board of directors of IFIA. We were reappointed last year for another two year term. And uh, currently we are also chairing the audit and finance committee of IFIA. We are also active members of a number of working groups. Um, there's a number of acronyms there, but uh, it's the inspections workshop working group who meets annually to share inspections related information. It, there's then the investor and other stakeholder working group, which forms a link between IFR regulators and investors. We also have, we also a member of the standards coordination working group and some of its committees that um, looks at standard setting from a regulatory perspective and the standards coordination working group uh, writes comment letters to the IAASB and IESBA on new standards. Then we're also a member of the enforcement working group that uh, shares information on disciplinary and other related enforcement matters. We're also a member of the technology task force, which I think is important to understand what technology is out there, what disruptive technologies are out there used by the firms 
and uh, keeping track of how those that disruptive technologies impact on the audit process. We benchmark our procedures and our outcomes, our operations regularly against um, international best practice through EFR. And we also influence um, by sharing what we are doing locally in South Africa, which so uh, we share and we learn and we benchmark with other international rec internationally recognized regulators. You, a regulator can't become a member of IFIA automatically. We are assessed annually uh, based on the IFIA core principles that we adopted. Uh, I like maybe just the two key elements that is assessed are assessed annually is our independence as well as the, our implementation of risk based inspections and remediation. So we need to maintain these statuses in order to maintain our membership and our status as a respected internationally recognized regulator. As you can see, the RBA is serious about audit quality. And we all have to be because of the impact of reliable financial information on investment in South African companies. Investments and capital that we so desperately need as a country to grow. And I'm closing. Inspections form a critical part of the functions of the regulator. To promote auditors compliance with the standards and in doing so promote sustainably high audit quality. We believe that our reports, such as this public inspections report that we issue annually, are also useful to a broader range of stakeholders, including assisting audit committees in their discussions with new or incumbent auditors on matters affecting audit quality and ethics. We also believe that the report is useful to other regulators and professional bodies in pursuit of financial reporting and audit excellence. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today, and I then now hand over back to Ntlambi. Thank you. Thanks, Imre, for such a... Okay, I think I'm back. Thank you, Imre, for such a detailed um, feedback on the strategy and the IRBA's involvement internationally. Um, I'm going to th take you now through the report, the inspections report that we are launching today. So going forward, it will all be about this report. Um, first things first, just to take you through um, the APA. The work of the inspections department is derived from the regulatory function of the IRPA. In terms of section 47 of the APA, um, this act requires that the IRPA inspect or review the practice of a registered auditor. So with this report, um, we seek to, um, this, this will provide insights on the inspections results, the outcomes, um, for the work that has been conducted by the inspections department um, for the past year across all of our firms. And like other bigger regulators, our responsibility goes further than public interest entities. So our inspections include the smaller entities as well as the public interest entities. The main objective of this report is to, um, amongst other things, to promote audit quality at a broader level in that the audit firms would reflect on the audit quality deficiencies that are reported and noted and see if um, these are considered and addressed in their system of quality control. In this report, we have covered the firm and engagement file inspections that are concluded and presented to the inspections committee in the last year of the seven cycle, starting from the 1st of April 2020 to the 31st of March 2021. You will notice that um, this report also includes a wrap up of the seven cycle as we 
we started from the 1st of April 2021 with the eight cycle. So you will see also that this report does not only include those files that were presented to the inspections committee during that period, but also include files that were presented to the inspections committee in the June and August 2021 meetings. As part of this report, we've included um, information that reflects the highlights on significant themes, common findings arising from firm-wide and assurance engagement inspections. We've included recurring findings. We have also included a year-on-year -year comparison of the results. With this report, we also have taken an opportunity um, to share some of the success factors that we've noted during our inspections, um, highlighting um, how audit quality was achieved um, that resulted to improved results at some of our audit firms. Other than the auditors, with this report, we seek to continue to reach a broader stakeholder use. The stakeholders that are targeted would include uh, the audit committee members, the investors, the public in general, the oversight bodies, company directors, the financial accountants, and everybody that is responsible for the integrity of financial information in the broader financial ecosystem. To create awareness on the importance of starting a conversation on audit quality matters, the risks and the impact they have in our economy. To encourage those uncomfortable or difficult dis discussions on issues that affect audit quality at our audit firms. To also address the gaps in understanding audit and expectations. And we also want these stakeholders to be able to read and understand our reports so that they are able to make informed decisions with regards to their engagement with their auditors or even auditor appointments. For the benefit of everyone on the call, I understand that we have auditors and non-auditors. I thought it would be important for me to take you through the inspections process. So the inspections department continued this year to conduct two types of inspections. We have firm inspections, we call them firm wide inspections. Because this kind of inspections um, look at the design and implementation of the firm's system of quality control to ensure compliance with the requirements of ISQC1. So with these kinds of um, inspections, we will look at the governance of the firm, for example, leadership responsibility. We will look at acceptance and continuance and all the elements of ISQC1, including HR, engagement performance, etc. The engagement file inspections um, are conducted at individual auditor level to ensure that the auditors comply with the relevant standards, the code and the relevant legislation in performing their audits. Our approach in the inspections um, remain the same throughout the seven cycle. We start with the risk identification and assessment by our business intelligence, intelligence function, followed by the selection and execution of our inspections.
The risk identified can relate um, specifically to the, an audit firm. It can be um, a risk at registered auditor level or a specific uh, risk at client level, which will include industry risks. So the analysis of these risks will be performed at almost three levels. The risk analysis is the one that informs our inspections process. Um, the inspections results will inform the remedial action process. So immediately once the results have been sent to the firm after the inspection, the remedial process will start. After that process has been completed, um, it will inform the, the BI or risk process. So our process, you will see that it starts with the risk identification, then it goes to inspection and reporting, then remediation, and again, it starts with risk assessment again. And there are some benefits in, um, in using the, the risk-based approach. IMBRE has already alluded that it is um, international best practice. And over and above that, we, we have noted that the risk-based approach allows for a more efficient use of limited resources. It is a flexible approach and it also um, allows for targeting of specific risk themes. It is an ongoing process in that you are able to identify new risks continuously. It also encourages collaboration and um, it's a collective approach with both external and internal stakeholders. Um, in, in, this, um, in this way, you are able to, um, to get greater results in terms of identifying more risks. The focus areas in the, in the um, last year of the seventh cycle, remained consistent with the uh, first two years of the seventh cycle with an increased focus on inspections on areas of significant auditor judgment, the financial statement reviews, as well as client and ac client acceptance and continuance, specifically independence of auditors. The IRBA also continued to focus more attention on the inspection of public interest entities, um, with most of our resources and time allocated to these um, inspections. However, it should be noted that the IRBA's mandate, like I mentioned earlier, um, requires the monitoring and inspection of all of the practice of all the registered aud auditors. And therefore, the IRBA continued um, in the last year of the seven cycle to include in the scope um, a, a variety of firms from smaller firms to bigger firms, non pies and pi um, entities. In this last year of the seven cycle, we also continued to escalate findings that were identified at engagement file level to firm level. If those findings or deficiencies were indicative of a deficient con of deficient controls at firm level. Once an, an inspection is completed by our inspectors, it goes through uh, various levels of um, of reviews internally, including our quality control reviewers, the team leaders and director reviews. After that, our files are reported to the inspections committee. Our inspections committee um, consists of independent members from different industries and backgrounds and they meet on a quarterly basis. 
So we have a minimum of four meetings a year. In these meetings, they provide decisions on each and every inspection that has been conducted during that quarter, whether firm or assurance engagement files. In arriving at these decisions or outcomes, the inspections committee would consider, for example, the nature and the extent of the deficiencies identified and reported. They will consider the potential impact to the public. Um, they will also consider the responses provided and received from the registered auditors in relation to the deficiencies reported in the report as well as the appropriateness of the conclusions reached by the inspections team. I'll just take you through the outcomes by the inspections committee. The first outcome is, um, is an easy one. It's a no further improvement required. I know all of our auditors would like to finally be there. Um, we do see a lot of them uh, moving towards that outcome. This is where um, an inspection was finalized and there were no reportable deficiencies noted and reported by the inspections team. We regard that outcome as a very good outcome. The second one is a some improvement required with this one, um, it is where, for example, there would have been um, findings or deficiencies identified and reported on the file. However, the extent and the intensity of these findings is not severe. And um, these findings will be in areas, for example, that were not identified as significant risk areas by the team. We regard this outcome as an acceptable outcome or level. The third outcome is significant risk uh, improvement required. This is where, for example, significant issues are um, identified and raised in the file. Um, it would be, for example, in areas that were identified as significant areas risk areas by the engagement teams. It would be in areas such as um, key audit matters, and it would even be in areas that are deemed to be significant risk areas by the standard. This outcome does not um, indicate that the audit opinion is, is incorrect. However, it is indicative of, for example, lack of or significant lack of documentation. So in this case, you will see that in when we conclude on this, we would say um, we are not sure whether the audit opinion issued by the engagement um, partner is correct. The last outcome is a severe one. Um, it is a referral to the investigations department of the IRPA. This would be a case where, for example, an audit opinion issued by the auditor is incorrect and uh, there is significant lack of documentation on the file in that um, it is not clear that the audit opinion has been supported by the, uh, sufficient audit of, of, of evidence on the file. Uh, this outcome also includes um, severe um, or breaches and uh, on the code or with the standard. In cases like this, you will see that um, most of the of the of the findings that will be included here, it would be, um, for example, very long findings and in that case we would regard that as an overall referral and you also see a uh, certain referrals in cases where for example there is one item or there is one issue uh, specific to a certain non-compliance with a specific um, 
uh, code requirement or standard requirement. In concluding on the process briefly, um, for the benefit of the non-auditors on the on the call, um, it should be noted that all of our inspections are performed in cycles. Um, I know that some of you asked what is the difference between the seven cycle and the eight cycle. You will notice that each cycle is um, over a three year period. So last year in, in April, we started an eight cycle. If each cycle will address certain issues and will have a specific focus. But I must say that the focus of the overall inspections is on the improved audit quality, even though there will be enhancements in each cycle that I will cover, for example, for the eight cycle. But you will see that the tone of the reporting is still the same. We continue with the same focus and we will tweak it to ensure that we monitor um, improvement in audit quality. In terms of the highlights on the outcomes of this report, we have noted a slight improvement in the 2021 report with regards to um, the overall outcomes of the assurance engagement inspections. With that being said, we still um, we are still um, concerned with some of the findings that we um, we saw in this report. In that um, there were similar concerns uh, as those of the first two years of the seven cycle. I will highlight some of the concerns that we saw in this report that we felt they were similar to the prior year report. We, we continued in this report to note the themes that were previously reported in the 2020 report and in the 2019 report on the recurring findings or repeat findings. The deficiencies were reported in relation to independence, whether perceived independence or actual independence. So the standard refers to both perceived and actual independence. In relation to the audit firms that performed non-assurance services to their audit clients. In that some um, auditors failed to identify the threats to their independence, or do not always appropriately document their assessment consideration when accepting or continuing with audit engagements with their audit clients. As a result, the engagement teams would not have safeguards in place or that the safeguards that are put in place are not appropriate to ensure that the threat um, as a result of the non-assurance services that have been provided to their audit clients is lowered to an acceptable level or eliminated. For example, we also noted during this period that some firms performed internal audit services to their public interest audit clients. However, we do not always see documented consideration that the registered auditors have evaluated these services to ensure compliance with the requirements of the IRBA Code of Professional Conduct and ISQC1. We also noted similar to the prior year that the, EQC, the engagement quality control review process at the firms is not always effective in that the deficiencies were identified and reported by the IRBA inspections team on the files that had been through the engagement quality control review process of the firm. So 
these findings would have been identified in areas that were scoped in or were included in the scope of the EQC reviewers. So there are three areas that I have highlighted in this report. It's the first of all, it's the recurring findings. The second one is independence issues. And the third one is the ineffectiveness of the EQCR review process of the firm. Like I mentioned earlier, all of these areas are areas that were reported in our prior year reports. And this is an indication um, that the desired improvement in audit quality is not yet achieved. In that some firms have not sufficiently implemented the controls to prevent the recurring findings and to ensure effectiveness of the EQCR processes. We also note that Consequence management at some firms is not effective, or in some, not evident. And as such, you see non-compliance with the relevant standards and EBA code tolerated. After the wrap up of the seven cycle, we considered some of the concerns that I have highlighted above, and we built in some of the improvements in our processes into the eighth inspection cycle. I'll just highlight few of the improvements that or initiatives that we have included in the eighth cycle. We've started the cycle, like I mentioned earlier, on the 1st of April 2021, and it will continue through to the 31st of March 2024. And with these initiatives, we do hope that by the end of this aid cycle, we would have seen a reduction in recurring findings. We would have seen um, lesser findings reported, for example, on the areas that we have highlighted in this report. There are two key initiatives which are new that we've added on in this eight cycle, in our eight cycle strategy. The first one is an easy one. It's a theme based inspection approach. Over and above the inspections that we perform year on year at our audit firms, we have now introduced a theme based inspection. This form of inspection will be conducted at firms when we visit the firms. The themes, key themes will be identified and these themes would be, for example, specific specific themes that were reported at that firm in the previous years. Or it will be themes, industry themes that have been identified, for example, through our reports, through EFR inspection reports that we see in a certain industry. The example of themes, um, that we we have seen identified by the by the by the inspections team, for example, would include um, in one of the firms where there was a finding on on um, archiving issues with regards to the the files of the firm. So um, the inspections team would easily select that as a theme and would focus on making sure that there is an improved re response or corrective measure in terms of the, the archiving of the, of the files of the firm. In terms of reporting on the theme to, um, response reports, um, we 
issue a report that supplements our normal inspections report to the firm. Um, all of these will be reported at firm level as it would, um, a theme would have indicated an issue at a firm level, an issue or deficiency with the controls of the firm. So in addition um, to the reports that we issue to the firm, we will also issue a theme, a theme based inspection report. The second, um, I will say, major initiative that we have included is an early remediation. As you all know by now that um, after we've performed our inspection, we would have a remediation process. In this process, um, we will um, follow up with the firms. Uh, they will draw up their action plans um, and they will um, report to the IRPA on the actions that are, are taken. Uh, subsequent to the report that has been received. Um, this process is does not necessarily verify whether the firms are remediating effectively because this information will fit in into our business intelligence um, uh, process and then it will go back to inspection. With early remediation, we allow the firms to um, commence with their remediation immediately once a finding or a deficiency has been identified and reported. This uh, will involve, for example, the monitoring, um, uh, the internal monitoring of monitorings of the firm. Um, so the firm will be required to subsequently our subsequent to our report engage with their monitoring team to select a number of firms. We said in the in the manual about three engagement files that were signed off by a practitioner subsequent to our reviews. They will review those files and they will um, identify and make sure that the themes that or the findings that have been raised by the IRBA on the file that was selected have been remediated or the key thing about this process is to um, prompt remediation and is to ensure that the leadership of the firm takes responsibility in ensuring that the remediation is at an overall firm level. Once this process is finalized by the firm, um, that uh, selection will be sent to us. We will evaluate. Um, the process and we will also uh, be able to select one of the files to see that the, the remediation is as they report it to be. And later on, we will be able to issue a supplementary report that will indicate whether the remediation was effective or not. Then there's... Um, other initiatives that we have included in the aid cycle. Um, for example, we have enhanced our business intelligence uh, function uh, to include a central database to also include data analytics for proactive uh, monitoring. And um, as part of our BI function now, we also focus on um, auditor use of technology at the firms. We do follow up on all the initiatives by the firms. The firms engage with us on all the innovative things they uh, they introduce at their firm. We have also capacitated our inspections team to ensure that we are able to to review such innovative or technological um, inclusions in the audit process. As part of the aid cycle, we have also enhanced our stakeholder engagement plan. We, this is aligned to the strategy of the organization to reach out to as many stakeholders as possible. This is to ensure that um, audit quality does not only end, uh, starts and ends at the firms. Um, those audit committees are also involved. The accountants are also involved in this. So we have had a lot of engagements with other stakeholders other than auditors 
to educate them on the use of our reports, to encourage them to um, reach out to us and ask questions should they have further or comments in our reports. We have received invites from several oversight bod bodies and we continue to engage with them to create awareness. Lastly, um, we have in our in our aid cycle strategy included that and um, an enhanced reporting. We had um, we have been using a certain type of reports in the in the seven cycle, but we felt that those reports did not really um, provide the user of the reports with an overall understanding of the quality at firms. In the new reporting in the eight cycle, we have included um, graphs. We have included information about the previous performance of the firms. We have also um, highlighted um, key issues and the impact to that those issues may have um, on the audit opinion. Um, if you read our reports now, you will see you will be able to engage and understand um, the performance and the improvements or if there is any deterioration in terms of the results you will be able to see by just reading our reports. I had mentioned um, earlier uh, that our process comes very late in the in the in very late after the audit opinions have been signed, but we continue to engage with the firms in ensuring that we are proactive as all of the initiatives that you would have seen that we have included in the eight cycle are proactive in nature. So we have also um, during this cycle um, included um, some initiatives in terms of um, creating awareness with regards to the quality management standards that are effective um, this year on the 15th of December. We have reached out to the firms um, and we continue discussions with the leadership of the firms. Uh, we take um, an opportunity with each visit to the firms. For example, at the beginning, as we started this, uh, the aid cycle, we uh, for all the firms that we have reviewed in the aid cycle, we would have discussed their progress in terms of implementation plans of the ISQMs. I also thought it would be important um, for you to remember the effective date um, of uh, the implementation of the ISQMs. And uh, we have noted during our discussions that the firms are very excited to implement the, the standards. We, we also realized during our, our discussions with the firms that some firms um, wanted to implement the, the standards sooner, but they couldn't because um, during the process of preparation, they, they noticed that it is not very easy to implement. Um, the standard. There is a lot of work that needs to be put in preparation for implementation. We also um, got to to sit in presentations um, and um, receive presentations from the firms and detailed plans were submitted to us. Um, and the progress on a quarterly basis is reported to us by the firms. We have um, we've looked at the detailed plans and um, where necessary we um, sent follow up questions and we are still in the process of evaluating some of the plans. We started with the um, with the top eight firms. We went through all of their detailed plans. We are continuing to engage with the firms just to make sure that we understand how far they are in terms of the progress in implementation. I want to remind you again that 
uh, we have our launch on the 15th of Feb, and I encourage all of you that you please um, register for that launch. It, it will be a very informative session, and I have also seen the light lineup of the speakers. I'm sure you will learn a lot from that webinar. The last part that I want to cover before I hand over to Marius for the detailed results um, is um, a report on audit quality indicators. It is coming out soon. Um, this report includes information about almost 17 of our firms on the, um, it's a portfolio of qual quantitative measures. Um, this report is most, this information is very important for use by audit committees or those charged with government governance to understand the audit quality at their audit, at their, um, of their uh, clients or future clients. This report also provides um, useful insights on audit quality. And it is the third year that we're issuing this report. And you can already see that you are able to, to see trends because you're able to compare year on year movement on each firm. We thank the firms for making it possible to be able to finalize that report, and you must be on the lookout for it. It's a very informative report. Thank you. I think um, I am done, and I will now hand over to Marius. Marius will take you through the, the detailed report. Uh, Marius is, um, is responsible for business intelligence in the inspections department, and he is also um, responsible for the review of financial statements. Thank you, Marius. Over to you. Thank you, Nishandi. Um, yes, yeah, the, the, the first slide um, I'm going to talk about is a very high level summary of the inspections report. And this is also available on our website in the format of a placemat. So that summarizes basically the results of the 2021 report and uh, the firm and file inspections. I think as mentioned earlier as well, um, for us it's quite important that the stakeholders, the users of this report understand the inspection results that we present in the report. Um, that's basically the results are presented on our overall basis. And therefore, stakeholders, other than the, the auditors, um, is encouraged to engage with the auditors to understand the impact or the results of the inspections that was performed on, on their own auditors and the, and the specific audit firms. This report does not reflect details of the findings on, the, on an individual basis. And therefore, the ERBA also started, as Nkhlambi mentioned earlier, with including more information in the reports that's issued to the to the individual auditors as well as to the audit firms by providing certain information in terms of prior inspections and comparative as well as the nature of the findings with that we we want to 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 provide more information to the relevant stakeholders in understanding the specific auditors and then obviously the the auditors as use of the report in terms of being aware of the type of findings, not, not necessarily always identified at your specific firm, but looking at the nature of the findings and the type of findings that was identified throughout inspections. So what we also try to do for the 2021 report is to refine some of the findings that and the way that we presented findings um, in previous years. And to make it more user friendly and also provide information and more insight into the nature and extent or impact of, of the inspection findings. As you would have noted, we're not limiting our detailed discussions in the report just to the say the top five findings that we identified, but we 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 changed the report to, to reflect 
five areas for engagement inspection findings and highlighting the, the top findings in each of those areas. And then also the impact of the number of findings that are less frequent in occurrence that might have a more significant impact than findings with a higher frequency. So as a result, you will see that the, the, some of these lower frequency findings or findings with a lower frequency of occurrence are the ones that resulted in the outcome with the for referral for investigation, most of the outcome. At the moment um, for this year, the referrals were 20% of the referrals, uh, the engagement files, 20% were referrals, but it's less than 5% of the actual findings that was identified on insurance engagement inspections that resulted in this 20% of insurance engagements being referred to to the investigations committee of the ERBA. On a, on a firm level, on firm level reports, um, though the, the, the number of findings resulted is higher, that resulted in referral to the investigations outcome is a bit higher, um, but the significant the impact of those findings are more significant. So if we move on um, and we start looking at the firm inspections, um, that we performed during during the, the last year. Um, so we, we performed full seven full firm inspections, so ISQ1 inspections. Unfortunately, all of the, the seven had um, negative results, with four of them with an the outcome of referral to investigation, and the other three with significant improvement. And Columbia also mentioned earlier that we, we escalate some of the assurance engagement findings that we identified during our inspections where we do not perform a firm-wide inspection, but where we found that the deficiencies on these files, you know, indicate um, uh, maybe the lack of controls or deficiencies in controls, and we report those and we escalate that to the findings on a firm level. So therefore, in total, 20 firm level reports were, were actually sub submitted to INSCOM um, in this period. And again, nine, nine firms were, were referred to investigations and the other 11 firms um, had a re re significant improvement required. So this 20 includes the seven full firm inspections as well. So the, the results at, at firm level have shown a concerning increase in the number of, of firms that was referred to investigations department, you know, from the start of the seven cycle. Um, I think of specific concern that we noted were the outcomes of that there were no further outcome, no files or no firm inspections with the outcome of no further action or some improvement required. Um, so the concerning number of referrals directly relate to the underlying nature of the reportable deficiencies that was identified at firm level and the escalation of inspection results from insurance engagement inspections. The urban remains concerned about the possible control deficiencies at firm level that indicate that the firm system of quality control or quality management is not effective to provide reasonable insurance that the professional standards are complied with the, the auditing standards and other requirements. Um, there's then a concern to ensure, you know, does the does the control environment ensure that the audit reports issued are appropriate and that it's supported by sufficient and appropriate audit work, as well as that there's consistent quality performed over all of the over all of the audits that's performed by the firm. I think the main reasons for referral on firm level was um, ethical considerations specific relating to independence. Um, I think there's over, in some cases, we identified the overall poor system of audit quality, and then also the nature and extent of deficiencies that was reported on, on the audit files. The next slide provides a summary of inspection findings for each of the elements of ISQC1. So we're not going to touch on all the elements. I think 
fourth most and the most important is firm leadership though it's not the highest highest number of findings i think that's that speaking itself that the that the firm leadership is responsible for audit quality in the firm on on firm le level as well as as individual engagement level so in general there's been findings across the entire spectrum of isqc1 these findings speak then directly to the implementation and establishment of policies and procedures that are designed to promote an internal culture that recognizes quality as essential when performing assurance engagements. I think in most cases, we've not identified that many concerns with the establishment of the firm's policies and procedures. It would be rather, you know, and sometimes also looking in certain cases at sections of the methodology throughout our inspections as is relevant. But I think the, the, the main concern was with the implementation of these comp with the compliance with the firm's policies and procedures and you know the, the, the compliance by the audit teams when they execute the audits. I think engagement performance, um, as you would see, that, that remains the highest number of findings. Um, as Nklambi mentioned earlier as well, um, the, the, the lack of EQCR, ineffective EQCR, might be one of those reasons. Um, and I mean, that's the nature of the audit firms. We, the auditors perform audits as such. And that is why we expect that this element would always remain the highest, unless there's but certain um, controls implemented on those engagement level to ensure that there's full compliance with all the standards. And again, most of these findings or the high percentage of this of this area of this element is as a result of those inspection findings that was escalated to firm level. Um, in the slides below, um, which we will get to, we can see that most of the deficiencies reported on were recurring findings that was identified and reported on in previous periods. Now, these recurring deficiency, deficiencies ultimately translate to systemic deficiencies at engagement performance level, resulting in a firm level finding being raised. I think our, our biggest concern um, in the current year, as well as in the previous year, was the number of findings that related to ethical considerations, which has a direct link to the deficiencies that was identified on insurance engagement inspections, specifically regarding acceptance continuance and the considerations, the consideration of independence on that level by the auditor. And this is also, as mentioned, one of the main regions, reasons for a referral to investigation outcome on both firm and file levels. Um, the issues we've reported, again, relates to the threats of independence um, to independence that is either not identified or that it's not appropriately addressed. And um, secondly, would also then be the EQCR findings. I think as mentioned earlier, the most important to us is, a, is the leadership setting the tone at the top and creating that culture um, to promote audit quality on all levels at the firm, as well as at all, all audit engagements. So if we look at the on the insurance inspection findings, so the file inspections, um, the 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 spread of the of the outcomes um, on an overall basis, um, and comparing that with inspections performed at JSE accredited firms, um, including and excluding PI and other you know, JSE listed entities as well as other PI entities. Is, is very, very, very the same, you know, it's much the same and that doesn't really differ significantly. I think with the difference, however, between these overall outcomes of file inspections is the, the, the reasons for the referral and the reason the, the deficiencies identified that resulted in a referral for investigation outcome. I think mostly on the JSE accredited firms, the reasons are much more specific and um, to a sp specific um, item that was identified or deficiencies that were identified, for example, independence, um, or we were identified that there was a material misstatement in certain financials or material emissions 
of disclosures that might have resulted in an inappropriate audit opinion. Where I think on an overall level at some of the smaller firms, the, the reason for the referral to investigation is more relating on an overall basis, um, relating to the lack of audit evidence and findings that were raised in basically the, all the areas that were scoped in the audit files that we, that we inspected. I think that's mentioned earlier again in in the efforts, and I think that's quite an area that the firms can, you know, address and concentrate on through the remedial action process is that the number of findings that resulted in the 20% of firms being or, or files being referred for investigation is very is less than 5%. So it's quite specific items. Um, and, and I think the our report does, you know, provide information on that, that that can be followed up and then also through the remedial action process. So as indicated in the report as well, I think the bulk of the remedial, the, the referral for investigation outcomes related to financial statement presentation, the disclosure, the material misstatements that were identified by the inspections team, as followed by independence related findings and then certain matters that was identified on the actual audit report in, in terms of the content and format of the audit report. So I think if we look lastly at, at the, the findings that was identified, so as mentioned earlier, we, we, we stepped away a bit to provide more information and not only included the top five findings in, in our report, but also you know, the phases of the audit and, and those areas that we think is quite important. Um, similar to, to previous year, the, the, the findings relating to the normal audit work site, for example, revenue, goodwill, the normal financial statement items um, remained the highest. And I think with revenue, again, featuring the highest of these type of findings. What we definitely want to highlight as well is the financial statement um, findings that's been increasing over the number of the years. Um, so in this year, we also provided or try to provide more information that relates to that, the different levels um, of findings in the financial statements, such as material misstatements or factual disclosure of missions, and then the review of the financial statements. So that means evidence on the audit report that, for example, the cash flow was actually audited that there's no material non-cash transactions. Why well, I use that, that example as well, that was one of the highest reasons in terms of misstatement that we identified is where there's material non-cash movements that's included in the statement of cash flows. Um, as you also would have noted in the report, um, the areas, for example, the audit planning, audit reporting, um, the completion site, those, those findings are less frequent in nature and not really reported that often, but the impact of those findings, for example, independence or the assessment of unadjusted differences or the assessment of final materiality, um, those items have a much more significant impact than certain of the findings on the normal financial statement items. Um, and I think a, a, a real focus from our side on this year's report as well, and what we try to emphasize, and I think that's also supported by, by standards that was re recently issued um, in terms of auditor judgment and professional skepticism. So if we looked at the findings, the findings that we identified on engagement file level, that 30% of those findings also had an underlying element of Auditor judgment, where the auditor are required to apply significant judgment and professional skepticism throughout the audit. Um, and I think that's kind of as important or sometimes more important to, to take note of is that judgments and how it ends up in being reflected on the audit file. And it includes all areas of the audit. For example, when you assess risk, um, when you assess the independence during your acceptance and continuance um, work that you do when, when judgments are required to determine the extent of testing, 
like the populations, the, the audit sampling, what extent needs to be tested, um, as well as then ultimately why you, for example, as an auditor, accept certain omissions of disclosures. And, um, you know, that's not reflected on the audit file. So in looking, looking at that, again, we, we try to pre provide more information to the users and the wider audience as well. I think this is to encourage discussions with the auditors and the clients by other, other key stakeholders to write, ask the right questions from auditors and to really understand the audit on an individual basis, the audit firms, how this, um, how can I say, called facts that's presented in the report on an overall basis, how does that relate to the specific audit firm that, that's, that's your auditor? I think uh, there's, there's quite a number of these findings. Um, for example, revenue judgments in the sense of significant um, accounting estimates, um, risk assessment, that's also a theme similar to those that was identified um, in the EFR report. So the EFR report, the 2021 EFR report has not yet been issues, issued. Um, I think we're expecting it to be issued a bit later in this quarter. And, um, you can also be on the lookout for that. I will now hand over to Peter Klute to take you through the remedial action process and the information that was included in this report. Thank you so much. Over to you, Peter. Thank you, Marius. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to our participants this afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to give you some high level feedback on the remediation process. <clears throat> Firstly, why do we have to have this process in place? Firms and practitioners, regulators play an important role to achieve though this improved order quality and serve the public interest. A um, lot of firms busy with the actual implementation of the new quality standards. And I refer you to 35B, ISQCM1, take appropriate actions to respond to identified deficiencies such that deficiencies are remediated on a timely basis. Now, after this, a typical process that, that you should have in place in your firm would be something like the following. Um, remember now, at this stage, you received your report, which should be factual. So you have to assess these deficiencies, um, include your, your whole audit team, brainstorm with the team, use the right tools. The tools that we <coughs> foresee the best one is the five whys. You can use any tool you like. Um, but this one works well for me. And then, of course, come up with a true root cause, an action plan. And then most firms I see also include a time and a responsibility pin down and then somebody to monitor that process. The biggest risk, of course, if you don't remediate, is recurrence of the deficiencies. And that can be pro problematic going forward. Um, it might be... Uh, where you have root causes not identified as true root causes, the action plans not implemented or measurable, and then ineffective remediation. Those are um, the risk areas that you should focus on to mitigate those uh, deficiencies not repopping or recurring. Thanks, Marius. Next. If we look at the stats, um, remember this is a three year thematic review um, for the seventh cycle. There's 244 discussions held with partners and firms. Um, the insufficiency there noted on 47% is basically the root causes that was insufficient or incorrect. However, it helps to discuss these matters. That's part of my process. And then after that discussion, the firms do feel that it's the, that, that they have adequate information to handle the next round of, of remediation. Where we see not measurable is specifically looking at the implementation plans of the firms where it's not measurable. In a sense, it would look something like, um, we, will <coughs> we will document better in future. So it's not re-performable. So I can't re-perform that in the sense that I like to see the templates change, the other methodology change. I can see the training being um, done by the firms looking at the actual um, attendance registers and so forth. 
So if you look at the sum uh, improvements, remember that is the old uh, conditional satisfactory. So there's conditions on this result that I need to see evidence of. Um, those are the sum improvements. We went through 38 or uh, 98 of those. Um, a better uh, root cause analysis there, which uh, only showed 13% insufficient uh, and 87% uh, suffi sufficient. Remember, I asked for the evidence, and I'm glad to say that 100% of the evidence that received were implemented by the firms. Uh, next, thanks, Marius. So on the thematic review, uh, there is in the three years, five top findings or deficiencies that we've noted. Um, I've decided for this purpose of this uh, high level feedback, the detail is, is in the PIR. So please do a thorough uh, study of that PIR important. Also use it as training uh, for training purposes, especially with the new intake of the the new clocks coming in through the system for induction purposes. Um, if we look at the, the two major ones, the top referrals to investigations, unfortunately, is the cash flow, number one, and number two, uh, unders and overs. Now, I've dotted down a couple of reasons, possible reasons uh, for recurrence, and of course, also um, as identified the root causes by the firms and action plans by the firms. I just want to um, emphasize that this is, is unique to each firm. A deficiency is uniquely allocated to each firm based on documentation or whether it was sufficient appropriate. So um, please don't use this as boilerplating copy and paste exercise. I think the process has been around the block for at least 10 years now. So you should actually have a proper method of, of sitting with your staff, brainstorming with your staff as in the previous slide, and also coming up with a two root cause and action plan around this. If we look at the cash flow specific <coughs> possible reasons for recurrence, traditionally it's it's regarded as a low risk area because it sits with, with banking cash. A lack of senior team member supervision and review came up as, 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 as root causes. And of course, the audit so software being problematic, like for example, a case where uh, automatically populating the cash flow and that's where it's left. Um, typically, the most likely root causes identified by some of the firms allocated to inexperienced members of staff, like first year, second years, because it fits into the cash, uh, cash, cash systems and debtors and so forth. The ISC 7 requirements not implemented and executed. How rectified by most points? This is your action plan. Enhanced review, uh, updated guidance and practical training was the ones that stood out. But you must obviously come out, come up with your own plans. If you look at the summary of unadjusted audit differences, possible reasons for recurrence, firm tools and processes not appropriate, insufficient remediation and monitoring. Most likely root causes identified by the firms include lack of senior level involvement at the review. We found that this is also problematic in the planning phases and the completion phases of the audit where there's lack of senior in involvement and the review of those areas. Lack of knowledge and training. How rectified by most firms, enhanced involvement and the review by seniors and also inclusive of practical interactive training. Uh, thanks, Maurice. Um, then I decided to Get back to basics with the five wires, just the illustration and example of an everyday process, how we get usually get to the answer within five questions, five whys, a little bit less sometimes, a little bit more sometimes, but this is just for illustration. Um, on the PIR, you will note that we've used for this example the journals, which is a significant risk area. So there's a detailed um, explanation and uh, method used explained on the PIR. But if you look at this, just back to basics, remember five whys, you can use it anywhere in your audit, counting tax, everyday life, wherever you are, you, you can use this as you have a deficiency, um, you can come up with the answer by using the system. So that's why we like it and, and it usually brings out the, the true root cause and things. If we ask uh, what was I was late for my meeting is the issue. Um, why? One, 
Why was I late for my meeting? Answer, I was stuck in traffic. Second, why? Why was I stuck in traffic? Answer two, I overslept. Why three, why did I oversleep? Uh, answer three, my alarm did not go off. Why four, why did my alarm not go off? Answer four, I did not change the batteries. Why did I not change the batteries? Why five, answer five, I did not monitor the low battery indicator. So for the two root cause on this one, specifically, I did not monitor the low battery indicator to change the batteries. That is why I was late for my meeting. So I just refer you back to the journals there. Um, same process that you should get to the answer and then it's easier to identify and, and come up with the action plan to address that matter going forward. Thanks, Marius. Just in conclusion then, when we do the audit, whether it being test of control, substantive testing, we know the what could go wrong. You design controls to mitigate the risk. However, when you hit remediation, we get the WWW, not the World Wide Web, but the what went wrong. So you have to step back now and, and, and as part of the process, uh, see what went wrong, have a session with your staff, design your your action plan through the the identification of root cause analysis through that possible um, why methodology. So rectification of those deficiencies, please remember to do it on all applicable files. The identification of those root causes through RCA and implementation of the, the plans. Remember your biggest risk is recurrence. Then just quickly, the assurance FAQs uh, from SICA. We are currently sitting on 12 topics. I regard that as your typical top 12 hot topics. So there's a tip for you. Please make use of those. It's being updated and will probably be released uh, soon. Um, there's also an excellent example designed by SICA on the completeness of revenue. So please use that as guidance, use that as, as a reference to the standards, use that as your training for all staff, audit staff, and especially your new impacts. And then just again, the importance of sufficient and appropriate documentation for re-performance. We've done a session on this a couple of years ago where the lack of documentation, how it can trip you over, is still on our website. There's important information there, what to look for, how a document must be documented, how a working paper must look like, and so forth. So please refer to that. And then, of course, the importance of information in IT. Um, emphasized yet again, IT also now part and parcel of the new quality standards. Um, I refer you to a non-authoritative support material related to technology. FAQ on there on planning this in incorporation and integration with your audit released by the IWSB um, recently. Um, we've seen now in the lockdown um, a lot of uh, concerns around the how do you do stock takes and and you not be able to get to the staff premises and so forth. There's a lot of innovation there. A lot of guys designed apps around this um, with with stock takes. Um, they use drone technology. Um, I think it's still a bit of a challenge to to design the controls around those. However, there's, there's, there's a need to embrace IT going forward, as you heard on the previous uh, speakers, that we've also got the, the two inspectors, IT auditors on our side that, that's looking at this. So it's important to actually uh, in, embrace that um, and make sure that, that we find that some firms that there's a little bit of a silo between the audit and the audit IT teams with regards to the work and the communication thereof. Um, so just look out for that. So um, from my side, um, that's a wrap. Remember, if you don't see me, it's a good thing. Because that means your house is in order. Thank you very much. And I'll hand over to Tandu from Saika. Enjoy your afternoon. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Um, See, that was a bit of a scary way to 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 um, to end off your conversation, um, but do take it, I guess, from from Peter's um, uh, message um, that if he doesn't see you, then 
um, it means it's a good thing. So let's try by all means not to but to see Peter's face. And let me just share my presentation and put it on presentation mode. Hope you can see it. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Tan Lohu Lemioli. I'm a project director um, at, at SICA um, within the Audit and Assurance Division. Um, yeah, so first of all, just to really take the opportunity to thank Erba, to thank the inspections team for inviting us to this, um, to this very important launch. Um, this report is on now based on our views is one of the reports that um, that the profession and when I say profession, I don't just mean auditors and the practitioners, but um, other users as well. So your audit committees, your preparers. Um, this is really one of the reports that um, as a profession we look forward to um, because it gives us an indication and it gives us um, almost a benchmark of where we are um, um, in terms in terms of audit quality. Um, so for us at SICA, the report is also very important in the sense that it really does drive our strategy. Um, it helps us to gauge those areas where um, practitioners may potentially require guidance on. So it does kind of inform the technical events that we host, and it also informs that the guidance that we um, that we that we do issue. So you may not be aware, but as SICA, um, we actually do not just meet when when the report comes out but we actually formally meet on a quarterly basis to discuss um, the status of findings on, 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 on inspections taking place during the year. Um, but over and above that, I think we do have this um, interactive relationship and active relationship um, where, we, where we discuss issues regularly, um, where we get opinions from the inspections team as well as the standards team on, on specific matters that may um, be posing as challenges to, to practitioners out there. So all in all, we really do give each other good headaches um, in terms of understanding the nature of the findings that are being picked up, as well as, as, as the processes um, that, um, let me just take this off, as well as the processes that um, we kind of get, uh, that get followed in, in terms of getting to, getting to the findings. Um, so over the years, for those of you who are very close to, to, to what we do issue as SICA, you, you will be aware of the guidance that we've kind of issued um, as, as, as the years have progressed. So Peter has already mentioned the frequently asked questions. Um, it is a non-authoritative document, but we do believe that it gives a lot of guidance, important guidance on, 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 on application matters when it comes to when it comes to the ISAs. So just getting to my to my presentation, um, who we are as Psyca Audit and Assurance. Um, so as you'll see there, um, that we um, that we really our main purpose is around providing guidance and technical resources um, to our members, um, particularly those in the audit and assurance constituency, on all matters relating to to the assurance field. So your audits of financial statements, um, review engagements. Um, something that is very topical as well at the moment in terms of assurance engagements other than those of audits and reviews of financial statements. So we look at all the de developments taking place within the um, field on, of, of non-financial reporting. And also something that you'll probably that's probably giving you a, a bit of headaches at the moment is around um, related services engagements. So the new standard that came into effect at the beginning of the year in terms of ISRS 4400. Um, so that's one aspect of what we do. Another aspect of what we do is really around advocating for our members. Um, so a very large population of, of, of registered auditors are also SICA members, um, or they're required to be SICA members now with a, with a new APA amendment. Um, so a, a, a lot of our activities are kind of tailored on, um, on ensuring that we advocate um, for their views. Um, so that's a big part of what we do in terms of our key stakeholders. Obviously, we've got the RBA um, as our big brother or sister, I know how to call it, but we um, regularly interact. Um, we've got the IWASB in terms of um, the, um, giving input into pronouncements that they do issue. Um, we've got the audit firms and practitioners um, that we get to interact with on a daily basis through our technical query system. Um, and through other engagements, through other platforms where we kind of get to 
uh, get an understanding of, of, of things that um, they're struggling with. And obviously other regulators such as the JSE, um, Prudential Authority, etc. And something that also Imre mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, um, they need to kind of look at the wider financial reporting ecosystem. Um, so we do have representation on, on, on a number of structures, um, such as the Audit Committee Forum, CFO Forum, etc. Um, so a lot of the work that we do, we actually um, we've got an advisory committee that um, that assists us in, in 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 terms of reviewing the documents, that assists us in terms of identifying what the key challenges are and what solutions we can actually um, bring to to to, to those challenges. Um, we've got the assurance guidance committee that helps us with 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 all of that, um, and and you'll see that in terms of. The composition of the AGC. I mean, we've got large firms. All of the, all of the large firms are represented. We've got this um, small and medium practices that are also represented uh, within that advisory committee. Um, consultants and industry experts um, also represented the academia as well as the AGSA. Um, yeah, so um, that's that's the assurance guidance committee, and basically any document. Um, that goes through um, that that is published by SICA, any guidance document um, that, that 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 we do publish has to go through um, the assurance guidance committee. So you can rest assured that that document kind of takes into uh, takes into account all the different views that um, that 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 one could encounter in in practice. All right, so I guess my main purpose here is really to highlight some of our initiatives that we've had. Um, around the around the the the, um, the 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 findings, the public inspections report. Um, so one um, of those initiatives has been around um, has been around technical recordings that we've got on our website, and all of this information is available on our on the resources page on our website. Um, so technical guidance, we have a monthly tech talk sessions, and in those tech talk sessions, one of the slots that we always have is around audit and assurance matters. Um, so some of the technical ga guidance that we've actually issued over the past 12 months um, is around, for example, um, the audit of non cash flow items. And again, just touching on what Peter Peter has just said around the findings related to non cash flow um, and to, um, to, to, to cash flow statements. Um, so we have we we have those technical sessions. And I think as um, as, as 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 people that make use of um, of this public inspections report, you'll find a lot of guidance within um, those, talk, those tech talk sessions um, that would be quite kind of useful to help you address some of the issues. So I've made use of the, I've made mention of the of the cash flow statements. Um, I mean, in that August tech talk session, we had um, a gentleman by the name of Bla Blaze Colivers um, from W Consulting, as well as an audit expert, um, where they actually um, went into a lot of detail discussing um, some of the pitfalls that they've encountered when um, when look, when looking at the audit of state um, of cash flow statements um, other issue other 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 recordings you'll find there recordings around isa 315 um, some of the recordings around the quality management standards as well um, so a very good resource if you want um, a guidance on on some of the aspects um, and then secondly we've got our accountancy essay articles um, we write quite a number of articles, and again, the articles through, go through um, a very detailed review process through our AGC. Um, so those articles, um, on top of that, they actually also sometimes you get input from from the inspections team, um, just to make sure that you know we um, we kind of cover the aspects that they feel um, that practitioners are struggling with. So a lot of articles that we've got also available on, on our website, grouped according to topics. Um, so, for example, again, linking to the issue of engagement quality reviews, mentioned that because that, that's the term ISQM2 refers to. Um, EQ, uh, engagement quality reviews. Um, so, we've got a number of articles that we've already included there that came through our December, January um, accountancy SA. Um, so, addressing number one, uh, what is the role? Um, what is the role and scope um, of the work that should be performed, for example, by an engagement quality control reviewer? Um, when they're looking at the annual financial statements, what is the role of the engagement quality reviewer um, when in, in a group um, audit engagement context? So a lot of articles there that will also provide a lot of guidance to and need a guidance to to our members. 
Um, but the one document that I just want to touch on and reflect on uh, quite a bit is around the frequently asked questions document. Um, I've put I've put the link there for you. I'll, I'll make sure to share the slides um, so that you also get access to um, to this to, to this document. Um, but really, the document does assist um, in in providing implementation guidance on how ISAs should be applied um, to matters um, um, to matters that, that also that arise from the from the inspections findings, but also to other practice matters that we uh, and practice challenges that we um, that we get from our members through the technical query system and also through our assurance guidance committee. So it is really a a, a, a good resource for our members. Um, so I'd really um, urge everyone, um, as Peter has done, to 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 really um, have a look at that document, to train your your new trainees on that document, your new managers. Um, if you're dealing with specific issues, um, I mean, we cover, we cover almost the entire audit life cycle. So, in on each stage of the audit life cycle, you are likely to get some kind of guidance. And also, if you do have issues that you feel the FAQ document does not cover. Um, I have put my email address there um, just to um, to so that you, you can raise I guess those issues with us. Um, Peter did make mention of two um, very important FAQs that we've uh, we've recently incorporated into the FAQ document. So if you scroll down, you'll see FAQ 11 and FA, FAQ 12. Um, so FAQ 11 is really about obtaining audit evi obtaining evidence about the accuracy and completeness completeness of information provided by the entity and um, that's one of the findings that um, has been recurring and over the past few years has been included in um, in the in the in the urban inspections findings report um, another finding something that we've done recently that, that we not um, I guess we have never been in the practice of doing is providing um, uh, practical examples um, so if you look at FAQ 12 um, that is a practical illustrative example um, that focuses on on, on, on the completeness of, of revenue, um, auditing the completeness of revenue. So please do make use of those resources. And for me, I think the one call really is number one or the two calls. Number one, make use of the, of the FAQ documents. But secondly, any issues that you do not agree with um, on the FAQ documents or any other topics that they feel should be covered within the FAQ document, um, do let us know. I've got, I've got our email address there. Um, but yeah, thank you very much again to to EPA for inviting us and allowing us to kind of create awareness of this this important document. Um, we we are in regular conversation with um, with the inspections and the standards. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I'm just cognizant of time. I think I'll just end my presentation there to allow for some questions from the members. So thank you very much, Nfabi. Thank you. Thank you, Tando. Um, so just want to thank Inklambi, Imre, Marius, Peter and Tando for a comprehensive overview of the public inspections report, as well as initiatives by both IRBA and SICA in support of the promotion of audit quality. Um, just by way of introduction, my name is Sadiri Srinarayan and I am a professional manager within the inspections department of the IRBA. So during this part of the session, I will share some of the questions which were emailed through using the designated email box. Um, I will be directing questions to some of the members of the panel. These are the members I think would be most suitable to respond to them, but um, the questions are really open to any of the panelists to jump in and add um, where necessary. So due to time constraints, uh, we may not be able to get through all of the questions. However, if we couldn't get through a specific question, we will try and um, respond via email subsequent to this um, to this event. Um, and also, please note, we've received many questions and we've tried to identify common themes. Therefore, we've condensed some of the questions into um, into a single question and, and I wouldn't be able to then name the specific person or the organization that submitted the original question um, per se. So I think in the interest of time, let's just um, jump right into the the first. And I think probably what is one of the the, the most um, important questions here, and I'll, I'll direct it towards um, our acting director of inspections in Plumby. Um, and and one of the the common themes we've we've seen come through in the in the in the email box is, what are 
uh, or what can firms do to improve their system of audit quality or the system of quality? Thank you, Sadir. Thanks for that question. I think one of the things that we have highlighted in this report, Sadir, is that um, we have seen quite an improvement where the firms are investing quite some time and energy on the on the quality management of the of the firm. For example, um, where you see involvement of leadership in audit quality, where you um, you see active involvement. We even see active involvement of the of the board members. They want to know what the findings are at the ground level. They are interested in understanding what are the issues that are identified on the on the on the ground level. And you will remember that in our previous cycles, we 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 had a process where we would raise findings at individual practitioner levels, and those file those findings would not necessarily be escalated to the leadership of the firms. Immediately when we changed our process to leadership being involved in the evaluation of the findings that um, come up at um, at inspector level that we did see a slight improvement in terms of audit quality. Um, hence, we continue in the eight cycle to see how else can we involve leadership in the in the in the process of our inspections. For example, you will see in the eight cycle that we have improved our engagements and we did get a very good feedback from the firms because our initiatives now are proactive. We talk a lot to the uh, leadership of the firms. If we identify issues, we immediately discuss those and give feedback to the leadership of the firm. Once that quality is driven from the top, from the top, um, the executive of the of the firms, we do see that we do see the, the improvement that is required. I always say that um, quality is not something that you are able to correct um, to correct immediately. We do hope that with continued improvement of leadership and active involvement in all the engagements of the firm, the remediation will go across um, all files um, in, within the firm. Thanks, um, Sadira. I'm just conscious of time. Thank you. Thank you, Ntlambi. Um, again, conscious of time, I'll go right into the, the next one. I, I can't see any of the other presenters uh, wanting to chip in on that one. Um, and I, I, maybe this this is a good one, um, Marius, uh, for you, um, in terms of how do we, as a South African jurisdiction, compare to the other global regulators when it comes to inspection reports and inspection findings? Thanks, Adia. Yeah. Um, so we, we are one of the founding members of EFR, um, and our processes are benchmarked on, on this international best practices as well. It was adopted by the EFR and its member countries. Um, so we intend to regularly attend international events um, and update our processes. Um, we provide feedback to local, to local initiatives such as the AQI process and then also in terms of proactive monitoring and theme-based inspections that we introduced um, to the, you know, within the commencement of the eighth cycle. I think, um, so EFR's results are based on whether there's one or more um, reportable findings or findings reported for certain of the listed entities um, where we include our findings on a, on a broader level. So I think the closest comparison to, to the engagement level findings is EFR with a 34% over all um, number of findings of 34% of, of the inspections performed versus ours around 56% of the inspections performed of listed entities. Um, I think what we also should take note of is that if you are only include the big six, as as Emre also mentioned earlier, um, they only look at pies or listed pies, and everybody look at all the pies in our our inspections, and then 
you know, our firm level inspections are not given an overall outcome um, in most jurisdictions um, where they make a high level comparison of, of that. So that, that's really impractical then to compare us directly with, with the results of other member countries. Thank you, Sadia. Thank you. Thank you, Marius. So I think I'm going to pause there. I, I know it's just hit four o'clock. There are a couple more questions, but I think we'll get back directly to the those who pose the questions via the, the, the mailbox. Um, I'd like to just pause the here then and hand back to Nklambi just for some closing remarks. Um, Nklambi, thank you. Thank you, Sadir, and thanks to um, everyone on the call. We've now come to the end of this session, and we, we hope that it was um, an interesting session for you, and we do hope that you will continue um, engaging with us if you um, have more, inf uh, you require more information or you've got comments or questions, please uh, forward to those we've provided you with the email address. We have also provided you in um, the slides that we'll share with all of our email address. You can send your emails directly to us. Um, I will also, I know Sadir, you've thanked all the speakers, but um, special thanks to Saika. Um, thank you, Tando, for um, joining and presenting in this session. And you have shared with the members um, a lot of in important information. And we we do know that you've got um, we've got a lot of initiatives um, in promoting audit quality. There's few documents that I will um, I would like you to, to to download. Please do download our report. Um, over and above the report, you should consider downloading our um, eight cycle. Uh, strategy manual that is where we highlight the initiatives in the eight cycle you will also um, see the difference between the eight cycle and the seven cycle in those documents um, also um, consider downloading uh, the the manuals with regards to the initiatives that we have um, included in the eight cycle um, yeah thanks everyone uh, you must have um, a great afternoon Thanks for attending.